now feels like the time at one minute past 12 to make introductions. Thank you very much for joining us um, wherever you're from and for taking time out today. Um, my name is Casper Bartington. I'm head of commercial partnerships at Association of Project Management. I'm absolutely delight delighted to be joined today um, by Joe Stanford, who works for the Healthcare and Project Change Association, and to our guest speaker, Steve Jenner. Um, I'm not going to introduce them in any more detail than I have done there because they can introduce themselves. And what I will say is give a little uh, structure around what you're going to get from us today. Um, so um, Joe will give um, some backstory to HPCA and why this session has come about in the first place. So thanks, Joe, for working with us on that. There will then be uh, so some slides from Joe. There will then be some Menti slides from me just to understand a bit more about who we have in the virtual room with us today. And then I will stop sharing that screen, although the voting will still be open. And then we'll hand over to Steve, who will mm. deliver the lion's share of the content today. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end of Steve's content. And then towards the very end of the session, there'll be some more evaluation mentee slides. So there will be three different folks hopefully sharing content today. Um, the first sharer is Joe. So if you'd like to share, away you go. Fantastic. Thank you, Casper. Um, and uh, well, happy lunchtime, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's it's really great to have so many people here from so many different sectors uh, so far in the chat. Do keep adding your name and where you're from into the chat. It's really great to see who's here today. Um, so as Casper says, I'm Joe Stanford and a quick thank you to Casper and the APM team for hosting this fantastic session. Um, so in addition to being a fellow of the APM and being very much involved in it myself, uh, for the last 10 years I've been, uh, I set up and led the development of the Corporate Portfolio Office at Health Education England. So this is a subject matter very dear to my heart. Um, my other area of development is around the project and change profession in the healthcare sector. Uh, and so I've been working with a fantastic group of people, some of whom are on the call today, which is wonderful to see, um, to develop the project community. Um, so uh, and, and to move that from a collaborative of volunteers to uh, a formal association. So uh, in terms of founding the Healthcare Project and Change Association, it's a charity to support the development of the healthcare workforce in terms of skills and delivery of effective outcomes for service users and patients. Um, so like the finance, HR and commercial services professional associations in healthcare, we aim to provide education and training services. Uh, and to support uh, workforce development and to provide community of practice, regional networks and innovations in project delivery across the healthcare sector. Um, and so as part of that, we are uh, very excited to put on events like this in partnership with the APM that's there to provide uh, learning and development and CPD activities for um, those working in healthcare and across other sectors, because that cross fertilization of knowledge and learning communities is going to be so vital to be able to deliver more effectively everywhere. Um, oops, sorry. That's the wrong one. Um, there are about 12 to 15,000 project and change professionals across England uh, alone uh, in the kind of healthcare sector in the UK. Um, and as such, the, those people play a critical role in developing things like portfolio management program and project capability and delivering on the benefits. But they're not the only ones. And when you look at who else is involved in uh, delivering on uh, the organization's commitments around change, the investment decision making board, the SROs, the exec sponsors, the commercial services team, the finance director. Um, there are so many people who have a really critical role to play in the effective coordination, decision making, investment and oversight of the outcomes of the organisation's uh, change, that it's really important that everybody has an understanding of portfolios and benefits and what their role is as part of that. So I'm hoping we've got a bit of a mix of folks today. So uh, it's great to see the project and portfolio uh, and change professionals, but I'm hoping we've got a bit more of a cross fertilization of folks here as well. So we're going to have a look at a little bit of a look at that by asking you kind of which sector you're in and what kind of role you have. Um, 
But in terms of then the association and taking it forward, our aim is to support um, and to work with uh, associations like the APM and the Infrastructure and Projects Authority at Cabinet Office that sets the direction for the public sector so that we can then implement those standards, those competencies, the ability to deliver successfully across this particular sector. Um, so if we can if anybody is interested in finding out more about the Healthcare Project and Change Association, if you scan the QR code, um, you can subscribe for free and that just gets you information and you can find out more about what we do. We get newsletters and uh, events and things that are available about what's happening in uh, the Healthcare Project and Change Association in healthcare sector. Um, or you can have a look at our website and see what's going on there. It's going to be revamped in the next couple of months, so do keep coming back and having a look for more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so in terms of this masterclass and how it came about, one of the things I'm really uh, keen on is that it's not just across fertilization across um, professions. So getting people in finance and HR and uh, commercial services together to be able to deliver more effectively. It's about working across sectors. So we could have done this just within healthcare, but it's really great to be able to see people from all different sectors so everybody can learn from each other. Um, and we're incredibly lucky to have uh, Stephen Jenner with us today, who <coughs> quite literally is the leading expert and uh, author of the seminal works around portfolio management and benefits management. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and he's worked uh, sort of significantly across the UK public sector. Many of you will uh, know of him and certainly uh, have read his guides to help you deliver on your um, portfolio management and, and benefits management. Um, uh, but also leading light in terms of evolving the approach to it uh, across the world. But let's find out a little bit more about who's here today. And uh, as Casper said, if you can uh, put your questions in the Q&A section, uh, we've got plenty of time at the end and I'll be working with Stephen to ask him the questions that you put forward. So make you get make sure you get yours in there first and upvote the ones that you want to find out more about. So if we can just go to our questions, uh, our Menti questions for you and find out uh, what it is that uh, you have been doing in terms of where you're from. So yeah, thanks very much, Joe. Um, so I am just about to uh, get my Menti questions up. Did we share the uh, code with folks for Menti? Um, the Menti code is is on the screen. So, whoops. So uh, here we go. And we will take it back to the first slide. So if you haven't used Menti before, all you need to do is go to the website at the top, put that code in, and that will allow you to engage with this question and the other questions that are coming. So I can see that the technology is working, which is great. Um, and of course, we will leave this on here for a little while because we've got at least 250 people um, who've joined us today. So I want to get beyond about 25 responses on here. So we'll leave this up here for a little while and um, just to give Joe and all of us, frankly, an opportunity to see who's joining us today. So um, healthcare is is up there, Joe. Although it's not the uh, it's not the only game in town, clearly. So that's nice mm -hmm. that we've got that diverse range, and it's good that we've got finance represented as well. Um, so we'll leave that running for another ten seconds or so, um, and uh, then we'll talk a bit about that maturity modelling, Joe. After that, so we can understand again not just the sectors that people work in, but also what stage um, of maturity they're at with regard to the topic Steve's going to be talking about today. So lots and lots of public sector representation, which is, I think, good. That chimes with Steve's background and your background as well, Joe. So um, yeah, uh, we don't uh, we don't discriminate against anybody, but I think we've got um, a good audience for you today here. So we'll let that continue to run. I'll move on to um, the next question that we've got. What's your role? Um, dear audience, um, in your organisation. So, so which one of these best describes you? And it probably shouldn't come as any great surprise that projects and program managers are top of the list given mm -hmm. the association's business, um, but we do have representation across a number of other sectors as well. So I hope that that will be reflected in the Q&A that we'll see a little bit later on. Again, we'll let that 
sit there for 10, 20 more seconds. So we can just make sure that we've got our distribution um, as representative as we can. But thank you everyone for rapidly getting involved in these activities. They are quite useful for us to understand our audience as well. OK, thank you. That's sort of stabilised. Um, so the other question that we're interested in, in in getting your response on is one that's really going to set the scene for the rest of the session today. So what is your organization's maturity level in project portfolio investment management? Be honest, these are anonymized results. OK, so we're not going to be able to attribute any of these to you. So so how is it where you are? I think I'll let this one run for a little bit longer and um, I think this will be very interesting to Steve and Joe in terms of who we've got on the audience and, and the level of understanding and, and activity that we've got across these five categories here. Quite a good so, distribution to be fair. So creating awareness is level one and optimising strategic outcomes is level five. So um, It'd be good to understand which sectors are optimising their strategic outcomes because there's potentially lots we could learn from them in terms of how well they're doing that. Yes, I'm not sure if there's been carry across, if it's been set up in such a way to carry across responses from one to the other. But of course, if people want to put in the chat, um, those who rank themselves five or their organisations five, um, then that will allow for those lessons to be learned or experiences to be shared let's put it that way instead so absolutely and and the, the thing about doing this on teams it's interactive so um you know if you put in the chat what your biggest challenge or your biggest opportunity has been in terms of implementing portfolio management it'd be really great for every for you to share that with everybody um and you know and everybody can learn from that as well so um thank you so much for contributing to that discussion it's been really great and really good to get those kind of insights um and the thing now is to say, well, actually, what could we do to improve it? There was quite a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, quite a spectrum there, and uh, particularly those at uh, awareness level, it's what do we do to move that forward? And those that are at a higher level, what can you share that can learn from? And Steve's going to take us through that now. And because we've got a majority of probably program and project people here who are involved in it, it's having a think about how you can engage those uh, senior people that perhaps need influencing. So there might be questions around that that you might want to ask or uh, suggestions you might want to share with others of how you've done that within your organisation. And for those that are on the investment decision making group, what is it that is important to you so that you can maybe share with others what it is that that is of most interest and most valuable to you in that investment decision making? So um, we are incredibly lucky to have Steve Jenner with us today. Thank you so much, Steve, for um, for giving your time to this masterclass. We are um, really anticipating what you're going to share with us today, and I suspect there's going to be something for everybody to take away. Um, and I won't dwell any more, but let you get on with it because um, we're here to hear what you've got to say about this. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, uh, can you see the slide? Yeah. All oh, great. So we are showing marvellous, marvellous. OK, um, first of all, I'll just look at the list of names and got some um, some familiar names that. Um, hi, Steve, how's it going, mate? It's, Wellington seems a long time ago now. Um, a lo load of people that uh, that uh, I've met previously and uh, and I should say. In, in many ways, the, 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 the real experts aren't people like me sitting in my backside writing guides. The experts are the people out there doing it in the real world. Um, that's where um, you know this stuff isn't it's not easy um, but uh, that's where the progress is made um, what are we talking about well here I'm talking about investment management I'm talking about that quote from the PMI which is um, if it was from the APM I would have used it but I, I thought it kind of summed sums this up this is about portfolio what's a portfolio it just means a collection in this case our collection of projects and programs so it's choosing the correct uh, or the appropriate collection of projects and programs and then executing to make sure you actually realize the benefits you optimize the value why is that important well because it's not your money um it's taxpayers money or it's shareholders money it's someone else's money um and you know if we want to do portfolio management well it needs to be benefits led 
benefit should be the driver, as we will see, behind uh, investment. We need to treat our projects and programmes as investments. Um, but if we want to do benefits management well, we need to be doing it at a portfolio level, a collective level, so that what we do is repeatable um, and applies across, as I say, across the, the collection. So let's have a look. So what are benefits? Um, measurable improvement perceived as positive by someone, a stakeholder. So there are two dimensions to benefits. And also I'm preaching to the choir with, with many people here, but I just want to make the, the point. Um, so a benefit is, is a miserable improvement, financial or non-financial. Um, and I should say, if we're talking from a public sector perspective, it always concerns me when I open a, a public sector a frame, benefits framework and it says there are financial benefits and there are non-financial benefits. Why did you put finance first? And I was doing, I see with some people from the MOD, did a session for the MOD I think last year or the year before, not so long ago now, and they said, Steve, we want you to um, talk to people about why, why they should take an interest in non-financial benefits. And I said to them, well, it's going to take me about 30 seconds to do that. And I said you know, on the session, I said, look, guys, I've been asked to talk to you about why you should take an interest in non-financial benefits. I've got some news for you guys. You don't work in the private sector. You work in the public sector and the public sector doesn't exist to spend money or to save money, it exists to do something sensible with the money that it has. Um, and that's something sensible in terms of services, in terms of outcomes, you know. That's what it's about, improvements in the services provided, improvement in social and economic outcomes, um, and hopefully doing that in a value for money way. So yes, there are financial benefits, but non-financial uh, should come first. But the other point about benefits, as I say there, it's perceived as positive by someone. And so we have a stakeholder perspective. And so this is a stakeholder management practice. This isn't about um, looking uh, backwards to the business case. It's about looking forwards and engaging with stakeholders to understand the value that we are creating. And primarily it should link to, those benefits should link to strategic objectives and we'll come to that. So um, obviously I wrote managing benefits, I wrote management of portfolios with Craig Kilford um, and uh, Craig, uh, many of you will know Craig. Uh, we have someone, some people with us today from the ONS and Craig did a lot of work with the ONS and I've got an example from the ONS. All these examples are now out of date. That's not the point. They just illustrate the, there to illustrate the points uh, that I want to want to stress. Uh, let's say anything else I want to make. Um, so dual perspective of benefits, benefits being the rationale. They shouldn't be, they're not a just, they're not the way we justify projects and programs. Uh, they should be the rationale for investment. Having said that, however, I say the track record isn't good. Actually, the track record stinks. Uh, worldwide. Um, when I talk to people, they often think I was talking to I did a session for uh, some guys working in um, some of the big infrastructure investments in Africa uh, not so long ago. And, um, you know, they were saying, oh, you know, it must be us. We, you know, things are so bad here. I said, guys, it applies all sectors and it applies globally, you know, infrastructure. Uh, ben Flupia, Professor Ben Flupia at Oxford talks about infrastructure investments having, quote, strikingly poor performance records. So the number one academic that's looking at return on investment on infrastructure says that infrastructure investments have, quote, strikingly poor performance records. And if anything, that record is getting worse. Um, the Olympics, again, a whole uh, history of, of failure, um, world record with uh, with Montreal took citizens of Montreal 33 years to pay off the debt. Um, the average cost overrun um, in real terms is about 180 percent on the Olympics. In cash day nominal terms, it's about 300 over 320 percent. Um, you know, IT and a lot of the work on benefits management originated not in project and program management, but in in IT. Um, there's an old book there, Crash. Um, uh, they kind of, they, uh, Tony Collins was the editor of Computer Weekly. He said not all big IT programs fail, just most of them. Now and again, serendipity sees a government department or a company by an IT system that does almost half as much as was intended and only ends up costing you three times the original forecast. Now, that's Tony Collins, the editor of Computer Weekly at the time. The HP, you must say, well, that's ancient history, Steve, if things have moved on. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the Harvard Business Review um, in um, 2019 reported that of the 1.3 trillion 
1.3 trillion dollars spent on digital transformation. So we don't call it IT anymore, we call it digital transformation. In 2018 in the US, 900 billion went to waste. So 900 billion out of 1.3 trillion, according to the Harvard Business Review. And I say, you know, Cranfield talked about 70% failure rates. John Cotter talks about 70% failure rates. Mergers and acquisitions in the private sector run about 70 to 80% failure rates. Um, now, does that, am I really saying that 70% of projects and programs uh, fail um, to deliver the benefits they were set up to us? Well, I kind of doubt. I think there's a, there's a nuance here, and that is it tends to be the bigger, more expensive, more complex projects and programs where the problems reside. Um, there are uh, areas where clearly the track record isn't quite so bad. But the point is, it doesn't matter how bad it actually is, clearly we're not, or quite often it would appear, things aren't as good as they as they should be. Um, why would this be? So we've got a problem. Problem is the track record on we're investing other people's money, we're taking shareholders' money, we're taking taxpayers' money, we're investing it in projects and programs, and we're not delivering a positive return. Wow. And even if we say, well, things aren't quite as bad as those academics and researchers say they are, uh, well, I would then say it's incumbent upon us to prove that they're wrong um, because we've got some Nobel winning prize, uh, Nobel winning prize winners here. We've got Daniel Kahneman talking about the planning fallacy. We're just simply overconfident, according to Daniel Kahneman. Um, he's ranked, I think, as the top three economists since the Second World War. Um, we, it says basically we just, we just suffer from we're overly uh, overly optimistic. Um, we overemphasize benefits. We underestimate costs, spinning success scenarios while ignoring the possibility of mistakes. Um, what it means is our business case forecasts are unreliable, generally unreliable. That's the uh, if you look at uh, Ben Flupia. He talks about strategic misrepresentation and see from his research. So this is a kind of world class academic University of Oxford professor at Oxford, uh, leading kind of researcher in major projects and programs. He talks about overwhelming statistical significance. Cost estimates are highly and look at the language, guys, systematically misleading. Not, you know, we did our best. We wrote a business case and then things changed. No, they're systematically misleading. And the benefit forecasts are significantly misleading. And the important point there, as Ben Flupia says, is sometimes people say, well, look, actually, you know, sometimes uh, we're not very accurate and sometimes we are very accurate. And he said, no, 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 you're this is a consistent picture and it's consistent in terms, you know, one way. You don't sometimes underestimate the benefits and sometimes overestimate the benefits. No, you overestimate them and you don't sometimes underestimate costs. No, you over, uh, sorry, uh, sometimes overestimate costs. No, costs don't go down, they go up. Uh, consistently and systematically. And Ben Flupia says, I say, strategic misrepresentation, by which he means uh, or says, it's the planned, systematic, deliberate misstatement of costs and benefits in order to get projects approved. In short, that is lying. So look, we've got some leading academics here saying that, you know, we're, as a species, we are overly optimistic and there are organisational pressures to write the business case to justify uh, the project. And because of these two things together, and I say Google the term, conspiracy of optimism. So it's a combination of the two. And you will find organization after organization that is characterized as suffering from the, uh, uh, the conspiracy of optimism. But there are other causes on the, you know, sometimes with the you know, business case may have been reliable, but we, the project fails for a multitude of reasons. Or we deliver the project, but we don't do any business change around it. What's called the build it and they will come fallacy. Um, you know, particularly you know, things like often tunnels, tunnels are being built and you know they will use the tunnel and yet people don't because the price is too much or they build the um, the the, uh, the pay road um, and people don't turn up and don't use it or at least not in the numbers that were anticipated. There's ineffective benefits management. You see the quote there from the PMI and Boston Consulting Group. I mean, the good news is interest is high, the bad news few are doing it well and not only a few doing it well I think too often people jump to easy to do things they write guide they write um, they write guidance notes and they redesign templates which is all kind of good stuff except it makes not a blind bit of difference um, you know we've got to focus on what really 
makes the difference. We got to say, so how good are we benefits now? You know, what what is our track record? Can we, do we know what our track record is? And are we starting to measure uh, um, our, our benefits going forward? I mean, John Thorpe, the uh, information paradox guy, um, famously, well, famous to me anyway. Uh, but I, uh, not only these sayings, I wish I'd said that. But uh, John said, when all is said and done, more is said than done. Genius, genius. Well done, Mr. Mr. Thorpe. Brilliant. Um, and there's no real accountability, as we'll see. Um, but fundamentally, what I see and what it, the kind of the thing I see is it's activity led. In other words, we start with a project, we start developing the business case, we think, what's it going to cost? 50 million. We think, God, we're going to have to find benefits of 70 million, and the game begins. We go looking for the benefits to justify rather than starting with the benefits that we want to achieve. Did a session for a consulting firm in London a few years ago, and at the end of it, they said, Steve, we'd love to do what you're talking about, um, but they don't employ us to tell them the truth. They employ us to write the business case to justify the project. If we don't do it, they're going to give the job to Cap Gemini or Price Waterhouse or Deloitte's or Ernst & Young. And I thought, you know, from the mouths of babes, absolutely. You know, and that's the, the root cause. We write business cases to justify what we want to do anyway. And then we we act surprised when suddenly we can't show the benefits afterwards. So let's uh, zoom on a bit. So problem. Doesn't appear we're very good. Uh, causes, a whole range of things there, but solutions. So what I'm talking about, I'm talking about being taking an active investment management approach. Teach, treat our projects and programs as investments. If you make an investment of your own money, you expect to get a return. That return could be in financial benefits, but it can be in non-financial benefits. And we need to deal with these things, treat these different categories of benefit in, um, in a different way. And I'll come on to that. Um, so active investment management approach, realistic in the planning, enthusiastic in the delivery. What I see in practice is uh, you know, over optimism in the planning and then pessimism in the delivery. Turn it around. Our organisations are full of people who are coming to work to make things better. You know, we should exploit that enthusiasm, engage that enthusiasm, you know, looking, being hungry for, for emergent benefits and a combination of practice or process, governance and a culture. And you know, if you focus on one, then the others don't happen. So hopefully what you'll see when I'm gonna zip through some of the uh, materials now, combination of um, some practices, combination of some governance issues, and then underpinning it all, a culture, a culture that comes from the top where we expect things to improve. We expect benefits. I mean, Chris, they often, uh, people say, well, Steve, Steve was the, uh, I was described as, not just uh, as the, what's, what's the, I was taking the lion's share. They should have said, I'm taking the Rottweiler's share. Um, we were described, or described as the Rottweiler of benefits management, only in the sense that I said, look, you know, you gave me a business case. The business case said, give me a hundred and I'll give you 120. Well, I've given you the hundred, now give me the 120 or whatever it was that you were going to give me. I want to see those benefits. And beyond that, actually, I want to see you doing better than planned. Um, and we'll come on to that at the end. First of all, disciplined portfolio investment management. Why? What do I mean by disciplined? Well, you'll see the quote there from Bob Cooper in Canada, kind of leading expert in the world of um, portfolio management for new product development. So very much from the private sector. He's saying the, you know, the difference between the winners and losers isn't that the winners do it and the losers don't. No, it's the, the winners do it and they do it consistently. They don't allow people to bypass the process. Um, and yet what we find is um, often people bypass the process. I just took the slide. This There's a slide I was going to include, um, but I'll tell you the story. Um, there's a rather wonderful book by a guy called Anand Samwell um, in which he identifies six or seven characters that kind of bypass the, the investment process. He talks about the screamer, the end arounder, um, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, the, you know, the, the guy that said, if you don't invest, it's all that the world will fail. And um, I, I was doing some a guide for some guide on portfolio management for the UK, for IPA and the UK government last year or the year before. And I put this in and then I had, they said, look, Steve, we, there's a lot of uh, overseas examples. Can you take all the overseas stuff out? So I took this uh, example from Anna and Samuel out and said, oh, no, not that one. We won't let that one in. Uh, and it was interesting. And all the people that reviewed it said, have you got more? 
and so it kind of that's just the kind of the real world is that we, our organizations are full of people that are that you know, they scream they use the decibels rather than the data to get their funding um they, they um uh, so they, they you know they threaten armageddon unless they get the funding so it is it's important to be disciplined to stick to your process the other point is here first of all it's about risk and return portfolio approach we don't just look at the return or the benefit benefits less the cost is the return um and that's financial benefits or non-financial benefits but we also um think about segmenting our portfolio so we start treating our portfolio um depending upon the investment rationale why are we making the investment is it for a financial driver if it's a financial driver revenue or re reducing costs then financial benefits are where it's at if we're investing for other reasons like mandatory because we have to there's a legal requirement or we've got a road that's going to collapse if we don't fill the holes or we've got an it system that will stop working if we don't uh, invest in it then you know the the benefits are the avoidance of bad things and so what we have here is we've got financial benefits and non-financial benefits we have benefits that are a positive improvement both financial and non-financial but we also have this kind of this, this category that are the avoidance of bad things now these aren't the same and you can't manage those benefits in the same sort of way if you're making the investment because you have to because if you don't do it someone's going to go to prison well or a system's going to fail then the benefits are tied up in business as usual usual so you have to adapt the approach and if it's about a strategy or non-financial what matters is are we getting the greatest strategic bang for our buck um i was doing it i say doing a, uh, uh, some work for a, a major multinational uh, organization in the private sector recently um and um we kind of they we kind of split the portfolio up their portfolio up into one two three four five uh, kind of headings there was the kind of mandatory legal compliance uh bucket or segment there was sustaining business operations so those two um bucket those two drivers came under that mandatory type heading they had a, a, a efficiencies to generate efficiencies to deliver efficiency savings uh they had an effectiveness um segment and last they had about enabling um transformation organizational transformation where the benefits are far higher harder to determine uh from the it was an it portfolio it was harder to link the benefits the benefits were from from the wider program and so you have to adapt the approach that you adopt to those investment drivers to the nature of the benefits okay so considering risk and return an example on the left hand side there so i'm, I'm not here talking about the um the risk to the project we're talking about the risks uh, of the project um what are, what is the likelihood that we'll realize the benefits you've got your benefits in the business case great well what is it must you know, is it 100 percent? i don't think so the track record would suggest uh that's not not the case um so um we're in a model here in terms of uh, degree of complexity quality of planning and capacity to drive progress and that would give an assessment of the likelihood of benefits realization and of course the sro's completed this and they all came back green and then we said that's great but of course you know we're going to be monitoring this and if your costs start escalating and your benefits start falling and your delivery starts uh, slowing down falling behind track uh, behind plan or behind schedule uh, then we'll be asking really you know uh, were you um sent were you making an appropriate assessment about having a high degree of confidence uh, in terms of benefits realization and so then people often said look can we can we uh, have the the report back steve and then people were you come they'll come back as amber and red amber and amber green and that's great because then we can at, la at last have an intelligent debate about how are we going to address the causes of failure how do we improve the confidence that we have that benefits will be realized i should say um, i'm rushing over this we have i'm strictly uh, time limited uh today so gonna to zoom on on the right hand side there's another there's another model i'm going to refer to the harvard business review the hard side of change management this is from uh boston consulting group it's uh online you can see it you can download it absolutely marvelous um and the dice model basically says the drivers you can you can uh, assess a, a project's likelihood of, of success uh in terms of so you categorize the projects as win worry or woe uh, you look at the duration of the project or how long it are, is there between independent reviews 
the, uh, the 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 skills and the competency of the of the the project and the program team in terms of the complexity of the project, the commitment of senior management, the commitment of local people, uh, the, re the recipients, the stakeholders to whatever we're doing, and the amount of effort uh, required. So there are models and frameworks out there, but we're trying to just get a, a feel for not only the, uh, the 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 scale of return, but also the risks um, and the likelihood that we'll actually realize those benefits. So attract, you know, risk and return, attractiveness and achievability. So that's a, you know, that's starting with a portfolio approach. Secondly, from a benefits perspective, linking benefits to strategy. And uh, there's an example here from the DFT a few years ago, um, but I say I'm using these, I'm, it's probably fallen by the wayside now, but that's not the point. And the next slide, I'm sure has fallen by the wayside, but it just illustrates the point. You see the quote, there's Anand Samwell from American Express on the left hand side, you know, strategy is the justification of last resort. The NAO the quote at the bottom, lack of clear links between a project and the organization's strategic priorities. That was the number one cause of failure in that original uh, list. Eight, eight common causes of project failure. I was talking at a conference in, because you may say, oh, Steve, that comes from 1824 or something. My well, friends at the NAO and OGC. Things have moved on. Well, maybe they haven't, because I was doing a talk at a conference not so long ago, a couple of years ago, and, um, and uh, uh, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez, he's the uh, ex-chair of the PMI Global, an incredibly impressive individual. Um, and he's now a kind of um, uh, a zealot. He's, a, he's, a, he's out there you know, promoting the, 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 the project community. But what uh, Antonio was saying, and his book at the, if you want to read a bit more, The Focused Organization is a jolly good read. But um, what Antonio was saying is, uh, you know, senior managers don't get it. They just don't understand the role of the project management of projects and programs and program management bring to bear. And in the audience, people were saying that our senior managers just don't get it. And I said, well, that's the plaintive cry of middle managers for the last 150 years. Senior managers don't get it. And I kind of sat there and I thought about it. Well, I thought, well, hang on a minute. If we've got a project and we don't know what contribution it's going to make, why would senior managers be interested? They would have no reason to be interested unless we can show what strategic impact we're making. And you can see this is the old uh, the, from DFT on the, the right hand side. It's very much the MSP model, uh, and they translated it. And this was from fra rail franchising, but they talked about, there about linking the benefit categories to the rail strategic objectives so that we would have a common set of benefit categories that uh, all our projects and programs would, um, would, would, would map towards. So we weren't asking people to rewrite their business case, but we were saying, given your knowledge of your project program, what difference will you make? So we're not interested in strategic alignment. I, you know, strategic alignment tells you absolutely nothing. It's strategic contribution. I want to understand. If we're investing for for non-financial purpose, if we're investing, for, I'm an accountant for training by training, by the way. So look, I'm you know Mr. NPV. But the point is, financial metrics are appropriate when you're investing for financial purposes. If you're not investing to deliver a financial return, then uh, financial uh, financial metrics really aren't where it's at. What we want to understand is, is this the most cost effective way of delivering the strategic um, objective or target that we want to achieve? That's what we need to understand. What difference will this project and this program make to our strategic objectives and benefits uh, will be the, the link. As our friends or my friends at the PMI say, Benefit project benefits synonymous with positive strategic impacts. Now, I would have paid the PMI to say that, but I didn't have to pay them. They said it. So that's brilliant. So if we start linking benefits with strategic impacts now, this is just an example from the ONS from a few years ago. Um, and I say the, the detail doesn't matter. It's just the, the principle that of a benefits map that you start with strategic drivers and your investment objectives. What are we trying to achieve and why are we trying to achieve it? Work out that. And then what would benefits mean in this specific environment? And there are financial benefits you can see there in category two, but financial benefits can't be number one. They have to be number two. So they had a, you know, in a category for uh, uh, stakeholder value, user value in terms of cost savings, time savings and improved stakeholder experience in terms of the quality of statistics produced by our friends at the ONS. 
So then the financial benefits being net financial benefits, because there's not much point saving £100 if it costs you £120 to save it. Yeah, the benefits need to exceed the cost, guys. Um, so it should be net. And then the risk reduction. Uh, and that was the kind of what was uh, uh, when Craig uh, was involved at the ONS that this is the what was keeping the, the chief exec awake at night. And so we had a, a and, and we then had ways of articulating each of these sub benefits that the projects on the right hand side would then uh, uh, d determine what contribution they were making. So just to illustrate the point, it's a portfolio specific benefits framework. Actually, it's not even it, it should be linked to the portfolio. And if you have a sub portfolio, your benefits um, categories will be should be specific to your sub portfolio. What is the portfolio seeking to achieve? What do our projects and programs? What's the contribution our portfolio make to strategic objectives? And then we have a common set of benefits because my friends from finance that are on the, the, this call um, from the from the NHS, you know, when it comes to costs, you can't make it up. You have a common chart of accounts that you have to use. Yeah, so when you're reporting costs, you have a consistent way of classifying and categorizing your cost. The same should apply to benefits. Beyond that, beyond linking benefits to the strategy, we need to start with the end in mind. Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey, the, uh, the author of the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just going to give you another example um, of the... Um, this a difference between financial and non-financial. Sorry, it comes now, actually. Um, the idea of um, start with in mind, be clear about the benefits you're buying. This is the investment stand, management standard from uh, from my friends in Victoria and Australia. It is merely there to illustrate what I'm saying. Um, you start with the problem or the, even better, the opportunity. Work out what the problem, the opportunity is, then what would the benefits be if we solved the problem or exploited the opportunity? And then we look to design the solution to deliver the benefits. As the PMI say there, the commencement of work is driven by benefits and identification, or at least it should be. Of course, in reality, too often it's not. Commencement of work is driven by the fact we've got a project, project and we've got to justify it. And then we wonder why it all kind of goes wrong. And I'm sure I'll get a few questions about that. We've got this project. How do we identify the benefits? Well, it's a bit late, I would say, if the project's already there. Um, the answer actually is to, to start with the benefits. But you can always um, uh, reuse uh, or start again. Just start with, what's the problem we're trying to solve, guys? What what would the benefits be? And then what should the solution what be to 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 solve um, to solve that problem? Um, and when I say be clear about the benefits that you're buying, what I'm saying in many ways, if we take the you know example I was um, saying about the industry, financial and non-financial benefits, and the bottom line is financial benefits have to have a, if from an investment management perspective, they have to have a cash flow impact. That's the whole point. A financial benefit should either be a reduction in cost or an, induction, an increase in revenue. And I should be able to see that in the bottom line, either in a budget or a profit and loss account, I should be able to track it through to the bottom one. Otherwise, it's not a financial benefit. Maybe something else, but it's not a financial benefit. And at one particular organization I was talking to, we, they, they said, we've got a project, Steve. And they said, can we claim this benefit as a financial benefit? And I said, well, what, you know, what, what, were you, what was the benefit about? They said, well, we were gonna reduce the headcount of, as part of what we were doing, we were reducing the headcount of this division by two people. I said, OK, well, has the headcount been reduced? They said, yeah. And I says, has the, the budget been reduced? They said, yeah. I said, well, it's been cashed. You know, you've you've realised the benefit. They said, so we can treat it as financial. I said, yeah, of course. And I sat there and I thought, why are they asking that question? And then the you know, light bulb went on. I said, so just go back a bit. Like, What's happened to the two people? I said, oh, they're on gardening leave. They're just sitting at home waiting to be redeployed. So from a project perspective, yes, they deliver the saving, but the organisation had, had no benefit. The two guys who were involved had a nice long holiday sitting around waiting. I mean, it's insane. Why would you invest to enable people to sit at home in the garden? You wouldn't do that. So the benefits were just things that we were using to justify the project. We've got about financial benefits should be seen in the bottom line. Um, 
And um, this point about starting in, be clear about the benefits. So more accurate forecasting. Um, the um, I say maybe I use a range forecast using pessimistic, optimistic, most likely a range of forecasts. You know, looking at the probabilities uh, rather than the single cost, a single benefit. No, let's just build a bit more. What do we think the range of outcomes would would be? Um, the McKinsey article there uh, kind of builds on what both Flupia and Kenneman talk about, which is reference task forecasting. In other words, if you're putting an IT system into a healthcare trust, you know, you just say, what happened the last time we put an IT system into the healthcare trust? You know, if you're doing a building a, a ring road, what happened the last time we built a ring road? If we're building a new tank, what happened the last time we built a new tank? If the costs were doubled and the benefits were halved, why do we think it's going to be different this time? So you're trying to um, adjust your forecasts. It's, it's the kind of root base for in the public sector, optimism bias adjustments, although we could debate that. And um, but there's a longer story that I don't have the time. But beyond that, this idea of challenge, challenge. People need to look at the business case. Uh, Kenneman talks about adversarial collaboration. I was at the OECD in, oh my gosh, nearly 20 years ago uh, in Paris. And the guy from Canada, Bob Mornan, stood up. And again, another quote where I thought, I wish I'd said that. He, Bob Mornan said, business cases contain assumptions that masquerade as facts. And I thought, brilliant. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've got to challenge. Challenge, someone needs to challenge the business case. Yeah, is the problem clearly identified? If we realise the benefits, would those benefits demonstrate the problem's been solved or the opportunity has been um, exploited? Do the benefits pass the so what test? Like, you know, we've saved the, you know, those two people. So what? So they can sit at home in the garden. Well, I would suggest that hasn't passed the so what test. Um, you know, we saved 10 minutes in Joe's time. So what? The benefit of saving Joe 10 minutes is not the 10 minute, the cost of the 10 minutes we saved, it's what Joe does with the 10 minutes. If we save staff time, the benefits, what we use the staff time for. Really, really quite obvious. And yet the frameworks that we use often allow people, encourage people to take the, all these 10 minutes and add them up and claim it as a huge number, as a potential value. Well, it's a, it is, it's a voucher. It's a potential value, but it's only realized if we actually redeploy the time to other activities. And really we should be able to answer that question because we're not investing our own money, we're investing someone else's money, my money, I'm a taxpayer. I wanna see the return. Um, so yeah, so just, and I, I suggest what on you know, business case page one. I want to see the sponsor's name and the business case writer's name. Put the names on the front cover. Own what comes uh, afterwards. And on page two, I want to know their track record. What's the track record? You know, was on the last three projects you that you either sponsored or the last three projects you wrote the business case for. How did it turn out in terms of cost and spend? Benefits and benefits realised, forecast and realised, and delivery on time or or late or, or or early. So I want to know what's your track record because if on the last three projects your project came in late, 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 under delivered, under delivered, under delivered, and cost more, 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 why do I believe what you're telling me this time? And the analogy I use, uh, my friends from the uh, the sponsors of this session from the the NHS, if I wasn't feeling too well. And I went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, I think you've got this um, this particular disease, Steve. You know, we could either give you the tablets or we can have an operation. But actually, uh, I'm going to recommend an operation and I reckon we can operate on you tomorrow. I might be tempted to ask, OK, doc, you know, I hear what you say. But what's your what's the track record of surgery compared with non-surgery? Uh, and what's your track record compared with other surgeons? in performing the surgery. And if the, if the surgeon said, I don't know and I don't know, we might be a little bit worried. I might say, well, I'm going to go and talk to another doctor, I think, get a second opinion. And so it is if we're investing bucket loads of uh, taxpayers' money or shareholders' money, we should understand the track record of those that are making the submission. What is their track record now? And if we do that, we then have an incentive. They also, they have an incentive to make sure they deliver on the promise. The business case is a promise. I want people to deliver on it. That doesn't mean that every case we're going to deliver on it, but we and sometimes we should do better, as we'll touch on. Validating and booking the benefits, so tracking benefits through to the user. Remember I said benefits are a measurable improvement. 
to someone. Well, I want that someone to agree the benefit. You know, if there is no one out there with an interest in the benefits, why are we doing it? I remember saying to one of our projects back in criminal justice 20 odd years ago, I said, look, if I cancelled you today, would the phone start ringing? Would it be users out there, business managers across the criminal justice system ringing and say, Steve, you can't cancel it. We need it. We need it to achieve you know, improvements to justice, to bring more offenders to justice, to improve victims and witness care. I said, would that happen? They said, no. I said, then why are we doing it? It's insane. Doing a session in Utrecht, and again in IT and the guide. Guy said, "Steve, can I ask a question?" I said, "Absolutely." He said, "Steve, we're, we're um, rolling out our IT system around the the Netherlands, but we can't get the users to agree the benefits. Yeah, can you give us some advice? How do we persuade the users to agree the benefits?" And I said, "Look, if you have to ask the question, therein lies your problem. If you've designed the project and developed it in secrecy, never telling or discussing anything with any users." Why the hell would you know, if you treated the users with that level of contempt? Why would they want to talk to you now? Crazy. But linking benefits here, validating benefits of benefit owners, booking them as an example there from our friends, my friends in uh, this is Telstra in Australia. Um, they won the um, PMO of the year in, in Australia um, with the uh, the PMI. Um, and you can see there this idea of linking benefits. If it was financial benefits, they had to be seen in in the bottom line in revenue, uh, increased revenue or, or reduced uh, operating expenditure. If it was non financial, they expect to see the benefit in the net promoter score uh, metrics that 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 that, that, uh, they, that Telstra were using. Um, and. I just want to highlight this, this issue of governance. Um, and just we'll start on the right hand side. This is the part of Kim talking about benefit owners and we've got the rather wonderful Steve Blades with us today and um, the guys that are working with you, you're immensely privileged to have Steve with you, but Steve's a real star um, and he knows. New Zealand were doing some wonderful stuff in the world of benefits management a few years ago. I think maybe some of that may have slipped and yet that's all too common. Um, usually we take two steps forward and one step back. Um, but they produced this guide to how to excel as a benefit owner. I think you can still get it online. But the point is, if we want anyone to be fired up and infused, it's the benefit owner. These people who, who should act as the pull for the project. They're the customer for the project. They want the project because they then they create that pull. But the whole point about government, I was again doing a bit of work on a governance course from in uh, in, in Queensland. To, quite a bit of work for QUT in Queensland, Queensland University of Technology. And um, we were looking at a, a project, a major uh, project failure they had. And yet there was, you know, it wasn't part of a program. It wasn't part of a portfolio. It sort of just hung there um, in midair. Uh, this is the model for my uh, good friend, uh, Ross Garland and Adrian Morey. Excellent book on project governance, about linking projects into programs and programs into portfolio. And if it's not part of a program then your project is still part of a portfolio. There is a governance model around um, your projects and programs. I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to have to zip uh, even faster. But the point is this in this idea of an investment decision isn't one off. It's not made once and then forgotten. Because if you're doing that, you're not an investment manager, you're a gambler. If you're investing in, you, in your stocks and shares at home, you don't buy, you think, oh, you do all the research, you find the five shares you want to invest in, you buy the shares, and then you don't look at them again. No, you monitor it. Some will do better than you thought, some will do worse. What happens? Well, over time, you think the world changes. So you adapt your portfolio. You sell some shares, you buy some other shares, you trade some. Um, and so it is with projects. We should be like, we should be risk managed like a project, like a, 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 a proper investment manager like a, a, a professional gambler making informed investment decisions as our confidence in victory grows. So this principle of staged release of funding, not releasing the whole uh, amount of funding to the project because uh, Tim Banfield at the NAO, got some friends from the NAO with us today, marvellous. Tim Banfield, no longer with the NAO, but well known, um, talked about the conspiracy of continuation. So the, you know, the result of all Tim's work reviewing project business cases and project delivery in the UK was he concluded there was a quote conspiracy of continuation, which he means, you know, he 
said, everyone knows, just get the thing started. And it's almost impossible to stop it unless things really go south. And one of the lessons learned is that whenever we stop a project, we should have stopped it earlier. So link the release of funding to passing each stage gate. Uh, each, there's a lot from the, the IPA there, these gates or decision point. It's a decision point. It's not a, a point, a time of congratulations. It's stop. So should we continue? OK, great. If we are going to continue, you know, if we're at a strategic outline case stage, right, you get the money now to move to outline business case stage or whatever your gateway model is. You get the funding for that till the next gateway. And then we stop and review again. Remembering number one factor in that Boston Consulting Group DICE model, the D, duration. In other words, you can have big projects with long time scales, but regular review, regular review. Is it still the right thing to do? If it is, great. And then we move on to the, uh, you get the funding to get you to the next gate. And lastly, a value culture, not a benefit culture, because this is not, not we're not talking about realizing benefits for the sake of things. Value is the difference between benefit and cost. Because you know, if you can get 80% of the benefits for 30% of the cost, then do it. And that's not a failure, that's a success. <coughs> so it's about value, the value, the relationship between the cost and the benefit or the, the resources required to deliver those benefits. But what do those two quotes on the left hand side say? They, what they basically say, I sum it up, I did a session um, in Wales once and because I was saying, look, guys, we should expect improvement. I want people to do better than the business case. And the guy stood up after me and said, I'm going to disagree with Steve. You should never do better than the business case. And I said, you know, you're a danger to yourself, you're a danger to your team and you're a danger to your organisation because you don't safeguard public sector jobs by ripping off the taxpayer. You know, we come to work to make things better. And what those two quotes there are saying, if you could do as well as um, if you could be world class, you know, uh, Michael Payne, Sam Retina, leading portfolio practitioner, you too will only lose 20 percent of your benefits. It's outrageous. Why don't we just take 20 percent off the top? No, we should aim to better the business case. We should because shouldn't we as time goes by, shouldn't we learn more? Shouldn't we? Sorry, shouldn't benefits go up as, as we learn more? Shouldn't costs go down over time as we learn more? Really? I mean, why do you know all over the world people say to me costs go up and benefits go down? Why? Because we allow it. We we shouldn't allow it, we should expect improvement. John Thorpe, I mentioned, talks about activist accountability. He says the buck doesn't stop here, it starts here. And our speaker's privilege, they're probably saying Steve's got to shut up, he's three minutes over, but I started late, so I'm gonna carry on. Look, I, I did a session for uh in a land not so far, far away. Uh, I was talking to SROs, senior responsible owners. And I said, guys, you you guys, according to MSB, you, you're the guys that are responsible. You're accountable for benefits realisation. And one of these SROs said, Steve, you can't hold me to account for benefits realisation because I don't control all the change required to realise the benefits. We are rolling out my, my programme across our particular government. I don't control all the changes. Therefore, you can't hold me to account. And I said, look, the world is full of people who say it's not in my job description. If you as the SRO don't say, I don't care what I directly control, I'm going to make it happen. You know, if you don't do that, who is? And that's the point. We should aim to do better. Our projects, if we monitor them on that chart on the right hand side, should move to the upper right quadrant. They should become more achievable as, um, as time goes by. They should become more attractive. If we're realistic in the planning and enthusiastic in the delivery, things should be getting better. And you might say, well, that's great, Steve. It sounds wonderful. But, you know, what planet, you know, what universe, what parallel universe does that exist in? Well, you know, there's some, some examples there from uh, criminal justice back when we were doing this and things were getting better. The numbers were going up um, because we were very started off by realistic. But we used to start off where I say with the top 10 benefits. So I said, just tell me what your top 10 benefits are and how much are they worth? And we should put things on a single page. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is not the detail, but get it onto a single page, a transparent view of what your benefits are and how well you're performing. Short summary documentation. But I say things have moved on. I've mellowed with time. Now it's the top three benefits. And hopefully you're seeing a slide from my good friends at the uh, at Dubai Customs. And Dubai Customs says, Steve, we just focus on the top three benefits. And I said, brilliant. Why? Now, why did you do that? And they said, you told us to in one of your books. I said, really? 
I forgot. There we go. So they did, and they I was they were showing me this model they have, this pretty us, usual bubble chart uh, with the various projects and programs. What I didn't realize immediately, but then they 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 because these guys they they were the smartest guys in the room. They said, um, Steve, these are closed projects. These are completed projects. We're still monitoring the return on investment. And as you drew, as you pick one of the buttons, you then got a um, a drill down a, a, a risk and a, a return on investments uh, report on that particular project. Ease or relatively easy because they were using a lot of financial benefits. But nevertheless, not, you know, that's not a side. There, there were still ways in which they were approaching non-financial benefits as well. So. <coughs> What am I talking about? I'm talking about? I don't really care that first slide and which are you level one or level five. It doesn't matter as long as you continuously improve. This is not a nirvana we seem to get to. We, you know, we're rubbish today, but in a year we're going to be world class. No, it's about continuous improvement. As a, uh, I think probably yeah, I mentioned Steve, Steve Blaze, probably he's probably in that room. Uh, you've got Steve Jan in Wellington, the, the benefits management community of interest. Um, a lot of people, you should bring people about 200 people together, sharing experiences. Absolutely brilliant champion challenger model encouraging people to challenge the approach to benefits management how do we improve there's a white paper there you can download on dubai customs if you can't find it just ping me an email and i can send you a copy but benefits management what did i say it was it's a stakeholder led practice and on the right hand side there andrew and sirkin talk about what they call a scout and beacon approach in other words the job of the benefit manager is not to sit in the office in front of a computer screen one of my friends said to me, Steve, my, all my staff are linked by umbilical cord to the computer screen. You can't get them away from the computer. No, cut that cord. They need to be out there like Indian scouts talking and engaging with users and stakeholders, understanding what's going on. Yeah, what difference is the IT make? What difference is the project making? What benefits are we realizing? What, what obstacles are we facing? How do we have un, un, uh, overcome them? What emergent benefits, what unplanned benefits uh, are we identifying or should we identify? So uh, not too bad. Oh, slightly over time, so I'm happy, more than happy to take questions, guys. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, and a, lot, <laughs> a lot to get into a, a short amount of time. Um, uh, the, there's been a fantastic conversation in the chat and people sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, <coughs> sharing uh, learning and connecting with each other, which is which is awesome. Politely, um, hopefully. Mm -hmm, sorry. Politely, hopefully. Oh, absolutely. No, no, very much so. Um, and, and I think a lot of um, uh, kind of a shared pain, I think. Uh, and and I think it's irrespective of what sector you come from. I think a lot of experiences are very similar. Yeah. Um, so so anybody that wants to ask uh, Steve a uh, question, stick your hand up, raise your hand in the chat and we'll do them in order. So um, you get to ask him directly and say say it how you'd like. Um, and while those are just kind of coming through, I think in terms of themes that that there's been quite a lot of conversation, particularly, I think, from a lot of public sector folks saying, actually, when you're told to do a project, yeah. because often it's a ministerial announcement and you have yeah, to come up on, with the benefits on. after Look, that. So really? watch the challenge back. Yeah, I know everyone, everyone always says that. Oh, yeah, they made us do it. Look, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, guys. It wasn't good enough for the Nazis. It isn't good enough for you. Right. Yes, that often there are. That's the real world. There are. But nevertheless, we can still still go ask the question, what difference will it make? And from my experience, ministers actually are fairly rational human beings. And if we can play back to the minister, minister, you realise by doing this particular project, you know, it there will be a cost that exceeds the benefit. But there are these other things that we could do. Or if you can say to the minister, we can do it, but it means we can't do A, B and C. Then we start to have an intelligent debate and it's our job as civil servants not to say to a minister oh yeah we have to do it because the minister said because i tell you usually it's because someone has whispered in the minister's ear so just be just obeying orders uh, sorry i don't accept that that's fair enough um and i think i think it's about how some of those messages are got across um uh and and who they come from. Um, one one question I think that that I have around that is that 
we do training around benefits management for projects and portfolio and, and, and change professionals but it's not done for business uh, operations leads. It's not done for execs and, uh, you know, SROs and, you know, non-exec directors. And yet those are the people who really need to do that level of in influencing. So, so whose responsibility do you think it is to sort of spread the word on benefits and portfolio management to those who have it as an add on to, uh, you know, a role in another field? Well, I, I think the good news is, you know, I, in a way, I used to say, look, there are three communities here. There's the kind of finance guys, the strategy guys, the guys that dream up the impossible dream and they put nice words around it. And the finance guys who put numbers to it. There's that, <laughs> sorry, that in, investment, <coughs> investment management community. There's the project delivery community that's sort of apparently supposed to be delivering the stuff that we require to achieve the strategy. And then there's the kind of recipient, the mm -hmm. business recipient of it. And of those three communities, there's one community that could, could say benefits is not our job. Mm -hmm. And that's the project and program management community. And yet they're not worldwide. So, look, I'm not going to, you know, you know, you've know, you got to recognise. So it is the project and program management community. Where does responsibility lie? I would argue fundamentally, and we've got several of these people in the room today, it's the portfolio function portfolio function if you're not doing benefits in other words you're not doing what does strategy mean for this particular portfolio and therefore what metrics what measurable improvements would we use and then all our projects should show the contribution if you're not doing that what are you doing that's the number one most important thing because then you're giving the tool for the projects and programs to demonstrate their strategic contribution but it should it is a primarily a portfolio role when it comes to realizing benefits and engaging with customers and stakeholders absolutely projects and programs are doing that uh you know it's part of their bread and butter that, that's apparently why programs exist to help realize the benefits but obviously uh, you know if you've got projects because you could argue projects don't realize benefits programs do except that's not always true so you know i think it's a Primarily that the responsibility should lie with the portfolio to develop the framework that projects and programs can use to demonstrate strategic contribution and then senior managers sit up with, with a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got Eileen Rodden on the uh, uh, who's ah, commenting in the chat. Oh, so from House of PMO good. and imagine she, and she, she's shared some kind of thoughts. Did you want to say anything about what you think, uh, Eileen, the um, the role of the PMO and particularly the portfolio office is around that training and development side of things for senior people and the operation side. Did you want to come in on that? I think you'll have to allow the mic, Joe. Ah, right. OK. So. Happy to let's let's find Eileen. So in fact, do you want to can you do that? Um, yeah, what we'll do is we'll quickly just get Eileen up now. Uh, yeah, two seconds. Because I said I'd, I'd uh, give everybody the right to put their hands up so they could ask questions, but then I hadn't realised that uh, everybody was muted, so they wouldn't be able to ask them anyway. Um, so just while we're getting Eileen on to talk about that, whose responsibility is it? Um, uh, she's come back with happy for comments to be in the chat. Um, I, I agree completely and I think that there's something there's a role for the APM around that and how do they support us with providing some of that you know the learning materials and how putting on events for uh, the senior people investment decision makers and operational delivery people um, and so so if I come to the some of the questions that have been posted up while well, um, uh, yeah. the more comments come in so that's going to be coming then um, so uh, there's a question from Serena Cousins about ha have you seen any good examples of successfully handling benefits, handing benefits realizations over to operations? Um, usually, well, there are, but it tends to be where the whole, the benefits have been. I mean, Dubai Customs were very good, I have to say, um, because their projects were basically driven by, by every project was driven by a customer in the business, a benefit owner. I, I would I would call them. Um, 
the banks, like the banking sector tends to be pretty good at, um, if you're going to pick a sector, I, I would say, and again, it would be financial benefit. If you're talking about non-financial benefits, um, I mean, usually people that, you know, far more common is the, you know, when do we, when can we stop tracking? Um, which means you're tracking for the wrong purpose. You're doing it because you have to do it rather than because it's actually giving you information. If it's not giving you information to improve your decision making, then you shouldn't be doing it anyway. Um, so, no, I, I mean, I think the, the, the issue is you, you only carry on. Um, you manage benefits for long as it as long as it make kind of make makes sense. Um, if your benefits are linked or booked and you're linking them to performance targets, then the planning horizon should be a lot shorter. I think it's often because someone is like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. You might, they, they find some some sucker and they say, look, I will pay you some money. Now go out and find, find some benefits to make it look like it was worth doing. So we get off the hook because the NAO are coming in to crawl all over us. So, or so, something like, yeah, we're doing it for the wrong reason, guys. Um, do, do you well, think sometimes it's a catalyst, though, because um, I, I think part, part, of, part of my experience is that pe some, some senior people are just not aware of it, that they don't come across it. It's not part of their training. They And because Absolutely. they don't understand it and, and they don't value it and therefore they need somebody to shine the light on it. Absolutely. And I, I think uh, Arlene's comments absolutely, I agree totally. Uh, and having said it's the job of the PMO or the, the portfolio manager, the portfolio in a way is the bridge, should be the bridge between the strategy and the kind of delivery uh, or execution function. But I mean, if you go, if anyone's kind of looking at the world of strategy, if you look at um, Harvard Business Review, they talk about the strategy execution gap. It's not a gap, it's a chasm. And they say basically most organizations, the strategy guys set strategy over there and the delivery guys do delivery over there. And the two just don't join up. Now the job, it's the job of the portfolio to kind of, to be the bridge between the two. So I would I would suggest that, and it's via benefits that that, that is, is delivered. Uh, I see Hugo, I mean, Hugo's re referring to the seven deadly sins of Anand's, absolutely. And what I say, you know, I just always like that. And, you know, Tom, as I said, I usually use it's the same character using all seven weapons. You know, it's the, the same sin, but it's the same. They use uh, every tool at their disposal. Um, but it was just interesting when we put it in the, the guide that so many people came back saying, is there more? We just love it. We just love it. We want more of that. Not And so that's the reality out there, which is a bit frightening. Now, Hugo, this is how do, how do we kind of overcome this? And that, of course, is the that's the, that's the challenge. What I would I'd say suggest is that's where the other two, because that's a cultural issue. So we've got a cultural problem that people think the process is something that we exploit. We go for a game. Well, we've got to change. Then you've got to go to the other two buckets and say, well, OK, well, you know, usually if we had a senior manager uh, explaining that's not what we expect anymore, we expect people to behave in a more uh, corporate and collegiate and joined up manner. But yet it's about governance, calling that out um, at a portfolio level and a program level. But it's also about the process so that you have a process which starts with on the left hand side. What's the problem or the opportunity? And until we've done that, what would the benefits be? And then what would the solution be? And then that we have a proper challenge to say, is the problem really the problem? Are the benefits are they expressed in measurable and quantifiable terms? Do they link back to our strategy? And is the solution, is it all necessary and is it sufficient to achieve the benefits that would demonstrate we solved the problem? Um, now, if we do that, start building the process, build the governance, the culture can begin to change. I mean, people often say, it's, you know, God, what, you know, how do we change culture? And you say, well, what do you mean by culture? And they say, well, it's the way we do things around here. Well, change the way you do things, change the process, change the governance that calls out. You know, my my boss, John Suffolk, when, you know, we used to be at board meetings and it was all falling apart and everyone was defending their own turf. And John used to say, guys, is this the best we can do? He said, because I'm seeing ministers this afternoon and do you want me to play this back to them? 
Do you want me to ex explain to ministers, this is how you as senior managers approach the problem of delivering on our mandate. And we'll say, oh no, John, oh no, so we're sorry. We're... So this is not about coming down on people, with, you know, with, uh, acting as a police force. The PMO is not a police force, but it's enabling. It's an enabling function, playing back, holding up a mirror to the organisation. Thank you, Steve. Yes, yeah, it's uh, there's, there's, uh, the, the questions are coming in thick and fast now um, and it's a little bit hard to keep up with them. Um, there's a couple of things in uh, Hugo's asked something about the investment in benefits. And I, I think that links in then with also the question about um, the programme and how long do you do you do it for? Because unless it's integrated in um, and, and costed in to the function, it's not going to be embedded, is it? Absolutely. I, all I would suggest is. If we do it the right way, we'll end up spending less money on benefits management and business case writing and portfolio decision making than we do now. How much money do we spend writing these huge business cases to justify? We write brilliant. I mean, I remember sitting there thinking this is my nightmare scenario. We're giving people better tools to write better business cases for bad ideas. I'm crying out loud. And all I can say, guys, is look, someone might say this is outrageous, Mr. Jenner, you know, you're making these accusations. All I can tell you, you know, I tour the world and I say to people, you know, what's don't let me put words, words in, in your mouths. What is the situation? What happens to costs over time? They say they go up. I say, what happens to benefits over time? They go down. Crazy all over the world. So this is the world we're living in. So if we want to change things, we need to be doing something fundamentally different because what we're doing isn't working. One of the areas that we've been looking into is around neuroscience for change management and I think there's something yeah. here about neuroscience for benefits management because the, the thing about what's in it for me in terms of whether it's the project manager or the SRO or the, the <coughs> minister or the, whoever's commissioning it is that um, often what's in it for them isn't necessarily a kind of global positive outcome. It's about, well, what's happening for me, my career and positioning and things like that. So so how do we how do we how do we look at the psychology of benefits to create that positive culture that says actually it's for the greater good and, and that reflects on the individual then rather than just effectively doing what they're told in order to maintain their position or career? Look, I, I remember reading somewhere that there are only there are only two groups in society who that who behave like rational economic man. You know, the what's in it for me, and that drives their their behaviour. Only two groups: that's economists and psychopaths. The rest of us are kind of weird and wacky. What motivates most people is: do you believe in what you're doing? Is it, you know, the whole thing: if you want people to do a good job, give them a good job to do. Mm -hmm. The point about project management. It's sexy, it's fun, it's exciting, and yet we drive all the fun and excitement out of it. The job of managers is to make sure we don't allow any of these sados to drive the fun and excitement out. They help them deliver change. I mean, this is exciting. This is of value, and people come to work. The NHS is full, you know, Ministry of Defence are full of people that want to make a difference. And I'm talking about people with guns, you know, I'm talking about people who want to make things better. And yet we drive, we often our processes drive their creat creativity out. So I think what we should be doing is tapping in to that enthusiasm mm -hmm. that people have. Give people, I mean, there's a quote we I put into Managing Benefits about from, um, it came from that the world of neuroscience and said, they said like, you know, people rush to get involved in anything that looks exciting and fun. You know, it's wonderful. It's like a zoo, you know? You don't know what's going on day to day, but my God, you look back afterwards and that was bloody marvellous. So people want to make a difference. It's about tapping into that. So I absolutely agree. And and maybe there's something this community and this group of people to can, to, can do, because actually reading the comments, everybody's very passionate about oh, absolutely. it. Absolutely. And yeah. we need to maybe create that movement for, for, for improving how benefits are done. Actually, we've got a question that I think is, is quite relevant to this. So so Reza asks, um, Steve, would you agree that a typical reason for failure in delivery of large scale projects is that it should have been approached as a large scale train change and transformation oh, and not just a waterfall stroke agile project? Oh, uh, absolutely. And that it goes back to that point, also linked to that thing about you know, build it and they will come as well. It's yeah, uh, it's 
let, let's just do the big thing. Let's get a big budget. Let's get lots of money. And it drags on and on and on. It's about sm you know, small modular delivery, agile with a small a. It's not really, you know, use use agile when it's appropriate, use waterfall when it's appropriate, and, you know, whatever, anything else in between. These are just methods. You use the method of a toolkit that works in the particular circumstance, but you should be driven by what difference you're going to make. Yeah. How is this going to improve the health of, you know, of citizens? How is this going to reduce cancer rates? How is this going to improve our educational outcomes for children? How is this going to reduce crime? Yeah. And if someone says, because it's going to save five minutes across 10,000 people, you say, I don't think so. Yeah, because we've done that before and it didn't make a blind bit of difference. And no one can get excited about that. You say, why are you coming to work? Oh, to save five minutes on a thousand people. No, but if you can, I mean, I was doing some work with some people last year or year before in about projects to improve um, uh, outcomes with Aboriginal remote communities, Aboriginal communities. Now, Jesus, wow. You know, that gets people out of bed in the mornings. <laughs> you know, everyone else on the, I wish we were doing that. You know, we've got an IT system in, you know, at headquarters in Brisbane. And yet these guys are up in weird and wacky places in the middle of nowhere, actually making a difference. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, so the challenge, I think, with that is that individuals can be enthusiastic and about individual programmes and projects when it comes to an organisation and the challenge of. Uh, so Eileen's put a comment in about the challenge of understanding where strategy formulation finishes and portfolio management starts. Yeah. So sometimes the strategy goes too far, develops strategic plans that haven't been through the practices of prioritisation, balancing, etc. And then you end up with an undeliverable portfolio. Uh, look. I'm sitting here spouting stuff off, you know, black and white, easy peasy, you know, this is right, that's right. No, as you know, I mean, say the world is kind of is kind of grey and lines become blurred. But it's only actually in the doing that we become aware. Um, but we should be, you know, our strategy function should be should be being informed by the lessons of delivery, shouldn't it? And yet I have to tell you guys, when I, I talk to project managers and I say, look, has a, someone from strategy ever come and knocked on your door saying, you yeah, know, we plan to achieve study. How's it working? The project guys say, no, we've got no other. Who are these people? We know they're in the organisation somewhere. But uh, uh, no disrespect to, to my colleagues who I won't name, but um, uh, it, it, previously uh, I was challenging str strategy colleagues who had written a 15 year strategy. Yeah. Now that's around workforce development and it takes 15 yeah. years to train a consultant. So so that's not a ridiculous estimation uh, about how they were going to measure the impact of that strategy. So how would they know whether or not they were on track to achieve it? And they said, oh, well, that's not for us to do. Our job's just to write the strategy. strategy. Absolutely. Yeah. So I said, well, who have you out. handed it over to? Who, who, who have you handed over to to do that work? It's like, oh, well, that's not our business. We've just put it out there. And it was never thus, Joe. And it was yeah. never thus. Because the, because we start from the view, we don't want the monkeys running the zoo. So the guys with the big brains write the strategy, throw it over the fence to someone else, and then get onto something else quickly before anyone can check to see whether it's actually worked or not. Now, I'm, you know, too often that's the reality. So that's a you know, it's a question of governance within an organization that shouldn't be allowed to happen there should be some accountability we should be learning as i mean crying out loud evidence-based decision making I mean, we're all told to be evidence-based apart from the guys that tell us to be evidence-based they can do what they like um, <laughs> and in a way look this is the problem this goes back to eileen's problem what we want of course is we want people in education with a fire to improve education we want people in the army we don't want people in the army who think the Navy is a jolly good idea. We want people in the army who think armies are really good because that they're fired up. But because of that, that's when we're caught because we can then become overly optimistic. Um, and so we need to have these kind of checks and balances don't we, to make sure that, you know, what we think we know is really true. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's too easy to slip into doing stuff that we think will make a difference, but it doesn't.
Absolutely. OK. And I, I mean, there's so many comments and so so much uh, many questions in the chat and just say thank you so much to everybody who has put their thoughts, their ideas and their, their challenges and their comments uh, in. And thank you, Steve, for providing us with these really great insights and, <coughs> and also acknowledgement of how complex and hard it is. I don't think I've done a very good uh, job of uh, managing the questions very well. So apologies for everybody who put something really insightful in there and I haven't managed to get to it. I think this is a debate that needs to continue. And I think, you know, part of this is, well, how do we take this forward? Now, Eileen's in the chat now. She runs the House of PMO. So, Eileen, if if you want to stick the, I don't know if you can stick the um, uh, link to the House of PMO in the chat so that people can kind of see that. But I think the APM has a role to play and we have a role to play and the House of PMO has a role to play to say, well, how do we improve this? How do we come together and say, how do we put on training for, for people at a strategic level? How do we raise awareness so that it becomes a much more uh, managed solution? Uh, and so, so maybe we can collectively have a look at that um, uh, sort of uh, maturity level and say, well, how do, how do we come together to move it forward? Those of us that are all passionate about it. Steve, thank you so much. That's been absolutely My pleasure, fantastic. As always. And uh, yes, a debate to continue. Casper, uh, do you want to uh, sort of round us off? Yeah, I will. Thanks very much, Steve and Joe, and a well deserved swig of liquid there for you, Steve. Um, <laughs> Coffee, I promise you. <laughs> I, I take your word for it. So, yeah, um, yeah I've, I've moved on. Uh, there's a couple of, of Menti questions. Uh, it's been such a rich conversation. So, thank you very much. Cool. Oh, looks like he's frozen, or is that just me? So if everybody can complete the mentee, um, uh, and what's your key takeaway? So benefits-led business cases will find themselves. <laughs> Connections uh, with like-minded people, um, yeah. benefits uh, definition and handling. Right, I'm back in the room again. Oh. So um, yes, I should be sharing um, another Menti question with you. So um, if you go back to Menti and, and just give us some thoughts mm -hmm. around what that number one takeaway was for mm -hmm. you. I know it's difficult. Maybe you can put two or three in, but what were the you know, what were the things you can take back to your organisation and go apart from the slides? You know, this is something we need to focus on moving forwards. And um, I think having that rich set of sort of, you know, couple of line responses there will be something that I can play back to Joe and Steve um, when the session is finished. Um, and that will give us some food for thought, Joe, about also, you know, what we can do practically moving forwards. Yeah. And who else do we need to include in this conversation? Because we're talking yeah. about things that are effectively sit with other professions potentially uh, in terms of how they work. So how do we who do we need to work with to to, to come together and uh, improve this whole area? Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Um, so what I would normally do um, is say, what other events would you like to see? And here's a QR code for APM events. But instead of that, I'm just going to leave this question open um, so that people can, you know, if they have to pop off and can come back again and look at, look at the question and put some more answers in. So, yeah, I, I will leave that there. Um, Steve, Joe, excellent facilitation. Um, thanks everyone for hanging on. I know an hour and a half is a long time to take out of the day. Um, much appreciated for everybody. So if you could hang around, that was great. If you had to drop off early, you can't hear this right now, but um, everyone's contributions really, really welcomed. So particularly yours, Steve, thank you very much. And particularly yours, Joe, thank you very much too. And thanks, Michael. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the great contribution.